Universal Center for Renovation presents Historical Israelites. This is strictly for educational purposes and commentary of biblical and secular historical literature. So enjoy. The name of this episode is The Land of Palestine, Israel, the birthplace of many civilizations. Eric H. Klein. 1177 BC, the year civilization collapsed. 1177 BC, the year civilization collapsed by Eric H. Klein. Turning points in ancient history and his summary in 1177 BC, marauding groups known only as the Sea Peoples invaded Egypt. The Pharaoh's army and navy managed to defeat them, but the victory so weakened Egypt that it soon slid into decline, as did most of the surrounding civilizations. After centuries of brilliance, the civilized world of the Bronze Age came to an abrupt and cataclysmic end. Kingdoms fell like dominoes. Over the course of just a few decades, no more Minoans or Mycenaeans, no more Trojans, Hittites, or Babylonians. The thriving economy and cultures of the late second millennium BC, which had stretched from Greece to Egypt and Mesopotamia, suddenly ceased to exist. Along with writing systems, technology, and monumental architecture. But the Sea Peoples alone could not have caused such widespread breakdown. How did it happen? This made you new account of the causes for this first dark ages. Eric Klein tells the gripping story of how the end was brought about by multiple interconnected failures, ranging from an invasion and revolt to earthquakes, drought, and the cutting of international trade routes, bringing to life the vibrant multicultural world of these great civilizations. He draws a sweeping panorama of the empires and globalized peoples the late Bronze Age and shows that it was their very interdependence that hastened their dramatic collapse and ushered in a dark age that lasted centuries. A compelling combination of narrative and the latest scholarship, 1177 BC sheds new light on the complex ties that gave rise to and ultimately destroyed 
the flourishing civilizations of the late Bronze Age. And that set the stage for the emergence of classical Greece. The globalized world system and internationalism that was centered in the Mediterranean and the Levant. We have seen that for more than 300 years during the late Bronze Age, from about the time of Hatshepsut reign, beginning about 1500 BC, until the time that everything collapsed after 1200 BC, the Mediterranean region played host to a complex international world in which Minoans, Mycenaeans, Hittites, Assyrians, Babylonians, Metanians, Canaanites, Cyprus, and Egyptians all interacted, creating a cosmopolitan and globalized world system such as has only rarely been seen before the current day. It may have been this very internationalism that contributed to the apocalyptic disaster that ended the Bronze Age. The cultures of the Near East, Egypt, and Greece seem to have been so intertwined and interdependent by 1177 BC that the fall of one ultimately brought down the others. As one after another, the flourishing civilizations were destroyed by acts of man or nature or a lethal combination of both. The Battle of Kodesh, 1300 BC. The Clash of the Warrior Kings, book by Mark Healy. The battle or war that brought about the decline of two great empires the empire of the Hittites and the empire of the Egyptians. The battle that changed the face of the Middle East. And ultimately, this battle changed the face of the world because the aftermath was the rise of the Hebrew speaking nations. The hand of Pharaoh Ramesses II of Egypt, grabbing the heads of his enemies that he fought in the Battle of Kadesh. This image shows the international scope of the war. This battle took place in the Levant, Palestine, Israel, but Every phenotype, facial feature, or complexion of skin, or color tone of skin is shown in this image. The land of Palestine, Israel, was indeed, truly, a land of international trade and international commerce. It's very cosmopolitan. 3,000 years ago. The land of Canaan, the birthplace of civilizations, Palestine, Israel. In the exploration of the complex relationship between Palestine and Israel, it is imperative 
that we first journey back in time to the land of Canaan, the birthplace of civilizations. This region, which now geographically encompasses modern day Israel, Palestine, Lebanon, and parts of Jordan, Syria, and Egypt was once home to some of the earliest known human civilizations. Unraveling the tapestry of Canaan's rich history and diverse cultures will allow us to frame a fundamental understanding of the subsequent Jewish settlement and the origins of the complex socio-political dynamics we observe today. The land of Canaan with its fertile soils, strategic location, and access to important trade routes was a coveted region for many ancient civilizations. It was here that the first seeds of conflict and coexistence were sown. The city-states that emerged, their interactions with neighboring empires, and the resulting cultural exchanges have all left an indelible mark on the region's identity. In the following sections, we will delve deeper into these facets of Canaan's ancient history. This early exploration will lay the groundwork for understanding the enduring ties that bind people to this land and the potent forces that have often torn them apart. As we navigate this historical landscape, we will also begin to comprehend the roots of the Israel-Palestine relationship, a relationship that is, to a great extent, a reflection of Canaan's historical legacy. The region's natural topography, characterized by fertile plains, rugged mountains, and access to the Mediterranean Sea, the land of Canaan was a land of many port cities, good harbors for seafaring, and they offered an ideal environment for the development of early human settlements after the flood of Noah. The Jordan River Valley and the coastal plains were particularly conducive for agriculture. This land was located in an area known as the Fertile Crescent, leading to the rise of farming communities. These communities gradually evolved into city-states, marking the beginnings of organized societies in Canaan. The prominent city-states of this era included Hazor, the city of Megiddo, and the city of Gezer. Each city-state was a fortified entity all oh, these are walled cities with gates, and each city with its own ruler and deity. The Canaanites worshipped many gods, and every city was ruled over by a different god. Often the cities were signified, or the gods were signified by the name of the city itself. For instance, the city-state of Hazor 
was dedicated to the deity Hazor, underlining the deep interconnection between religion and governance in these early societies. Each city was ruled by a god, and the governors of those cities were representing a particular Canaanite god. Armageddon. The word Megiddo, the city of Megiddo, has its meaning in the name Armageddon because Armageddon means hill of Megiddo. So the city of Megiddo is where the word Armageddon comes from. And Armageddon is the site or time of a final and conclusive battle between the forces of good and evil in the land of Palestine and Canaan the city of Megiddo. The city-state of Megiddo, strategically located on the trade route connecting Egypt with Mesopotamia, was another influential Canaanite city-state. Megiddo's significance is underscored by its frequent mentions in ancient texts and the Bible, archaeological excavations at Megiddo have revealed layers of continuous occupation, indicating the city's resilience and adaptability in the face of changing political landscapes. Geographical significance and early settlements. Canaan's geographical location was of immense significance and it played a crucial role in shaping the region's history and cultural dynamics. Straddling the crossroads of Africa, Asia, and Europe, Canaan was an important junction for ancient trade routes, including the renowned Incense Road and King's Highway. This strategic position made Canaan a hub of economic activity and a melting pot of diverse civilizations. Influence of neighboring empires, Egypt, Assyria, and Babylon. The development of the Canaanite city-state did not occur in isolation. Their growth and evolution were significantly shaped by the broader geopolitical dynamics of the ancient Near East. In particular, the empires of Egypt, Assyria, and Babylon played a crucial role in shaping the course of Canaan's history. The influence of these empires on Canaan was multifaceted. They brought with them new technologies, administrative systems, and cultural practices which left an indelible mark on Canaanite society. At the same time, they also introduced new elements of conflict and competition, shaping the region's political landscape in ways that would have lasting impacts. Early Archaeological findings from these city-states provide evidence of sophisticated urban planning with well-constructed roads, 
water systems, and monumental architecture. These city-states were not isolated entities, but part of a network of trade, exchange, and sometimes conflict with each other and with the powerful empires of Egypt, Assyria, and Babylon. Despite the challenges posed by the often volatile political landscape, these early Canaanite settlements thrived for centuries, leaving a rich archaeological and cultural legacy. They laid the groundwork for the diverse cultures, languages, and religions that would later shape the region's identity. The geographical significance of Canaan and its early settlements played a pivotal role in the region's historical trajectory, setting the stage for the arrival of the Israelites. As we delve deeper into this history, we will continue to see the impact of these early civilizations on the socio-political dynamics of the land that would eventually become Palestine and Israel. The Battles and Victories of Ramesses the second barrel of Egypt from the great temple at Abu Simbel in the south of Egypt. Pharaoh or Ramesses the second of Egypt grabbing the heads of his enemies the different nations of the Levant and the Middle East Pharaoh Ramesses in his chariot with his bow in his hands shooting a arrow at his enemies. In his book The Mediterranean Race a study of the origin of European people Giuseppe Sergi, an Italian anthropologist of the early 20th century. Giuseppe Sergi compares pictorially the features of Ramesses II with that of Matisse, noted Negro king of Uganda, and shows the mocked resemblance. On the left is the face or the mummy of Ramesses the second and on the right is the King Matesse of Uganda. According to Giuseppe, Matisse resembled Ramesses the second. And here we have an image from the tombs of Egypt. We have Pharaoh Ramesses the second fighting his enemy represented by a Libyan who are classified today as Berbers. But biblically they are known as children of the son of Ham called Put. Put. And Egyptians were the sons of Ham called Mizraim. Today the Libyans are the Berbers of North Africa. In this picture we have a view of 
an artist representation of the battle of Kadesh that took place in Palestine, Israel, 3,000 years ago. In this picture, there are three chariot riders who were classified by the anthropologists, the archaeologists as mongoloid. That's their classification. Today, these people would be classified as Asian or Chinese, Japanese. But three different nations are represented by this type. Moab, Ammon, and the Hittites who lived in Turkey. This image is to prove that people of Asian physical types were living in the Middle East. This picture is the same picture from the previous one, the Battle of Kadesh. But the focus at this point, the perspective is these people in this image were classified by the anthropologists as Negroid, known in the scriptures as Kushites. The ancient Israelites, some members, especially members like Judah, Benjamin, and Levi, were classified as Ethiopians. The northern tribes were classified as Indians. We're going to prove that later. But this is to show that with people classified as Negroid or so-called black people also lived in the Middle East. And this image is from the tombs of Egypt or from Egyptian archaeology. The men in the chariots are ancient Egyptians. The men on foot are the ancient Kushites, also known as Ethiopians. Both the Egyptians and the Kushites were from the son of Ham, the son of Noah. This is just a brief preview of what I'm trying to demonstrate on the composition and physical makeup of the people of the Middle East 3,000 years ago. This image is from the tomb or a city in Mesopotamia in the country of Iraq today. And these people are ancient Syrians known in the scriptures or the biblical historical records or the Tanakh as Aram, son of Shem. These are Syrians, ancient Syrians. And here is a modern day reconstruction of ancient Syrians. They have a more typical physical look that we or modern contemporary academia, scholars, professors, anthropologists, their physical types is what is commonly known today as Middle Eastern. But I'm going to go a little deeper later into what and how the ancient Syrians classify themselves as later in a different video. 3,000 years ago, there was a war or battle that took place in the land of Palestine, Israel, that destroyed the Bronze Age civilization. This battle involved many nations. 
The Battle of Kadesh took place between the Egyptian Empire and the Hittite Empire in the 13th century BC, with the former led by Ramesses II and the latter led by Muwatali II. Both sides engaged each other at the Orontes River, just upstream of Lake Homs and near the archaeological site of Kadesh, along what is today the Lebanon-Syria border. This is the earliest pitched battle in recorded history for which details of tactics and formations are known. It is believed to have been the largest chariot-involved battle ever fought, involving between 5,000 and 6,000 chariots in total. The Battle of Kadesh was the Egyptian Empire against the Hittite Empire. But the Hittites of history were not the Hittites of biblical history. The Hittites were not the biblical Hittites. The Hittites were actually the sons of Japhet, Togoma. So this battle was the sons of Togomar versus sons of Mizraim or Egyptians. And it's a map. It's a geographic identification map from Flavius Josephus around the year 100 AD. And on the top where Turkey is, there's a circle. And in that circle is the name Togoma. Togoma are the Hittites of actual history. Beneath that, in North Africa and Egypt, there's a circle, Mizraim, or also known as Egyptians. This war was fought against the sons of Japheth, Togoma, against the sons of Ham, Mizraim, and all nations in the surrounding area were involved in in that conflict 3,000 years ago. The historical Hittites or the biblical Togoma. Togoma is a figure in the table of nations in Genesis chapter 10. The list of descendants of Noah that represents the people's known to the ancient Hebrews. Togoma is among the descendants of Japheth and is thought to represent some people located in Anatolia or Turkey today. Also in the New Testament, Anatolia was called Asia Minor. And this is an image of a man or of a physical type that represent what the ancient Hittites would have looked like or physically or their physical characteristics and features. This man is of a Asian type of people that live today in Siberia in Russia. An Asian type, physical type, cast of face, or phenotype. The ancient Hittites were not the modern day Chinese or Japanese, but they had an A Asian type phenotype or facial features, Hittites. The Hittites were an Anatolian Indo-European people who formed 
one of the first major civilizations of Bronze Age West Asia. Known in modern times as the Hittite Empire, it reached its height during the mid 14th century BC. It encompassed most of Anatolia or Turkey and parts of the northern Levant or Syria and upper Mesopotamia or northern Iraq today. This is a Hittite man and army and formation. The Hittites are usually drawn by artists in modern day times based on history and anthropological evidence as having little to none hair as far as mustaches or beards because they're trying to depict an ancient Asian type sort of like a Native American type but these are not Native Americans that type of facial feature Native Americans were a type clearly seen and native to the Middle East 3,000 years ago the Middle East was a land where all facial features and phenotypes existed together the children of Noah the Enedic Vas also known as a Husay Enedid Vas a large four-handled Hittite terracotta vase or vase with scenes and relief depicting a sacred wedding ceremony mid 17th century BC in a Depke Tepe Museum of Anatolian Civilizations Ankara and as you can see this vase or vase depicts the actual Hittites of history these little brown figures represent the actual Hittites of history how they depicted themselves sort of like Native Americans and facial features and they lived in ancient Turkey we understand and know from ancient history and ancient archaeological records that the actual Native Americans were and are Israelites but that physical type existed in the Middle East within the Hittites population as well as the Israelite population an artist or modern artist depiction of an ancient Hittite man this man sort of looks like Conan the barbarian who in fiction is Sumerian he's sort of resembles a Native American like an Apache beardless a man who has little to no hair on his face like an Apache or Sioux a Hittite Asian in features or if not Asian sort of like a Native American and here's another vase of the Hittites archaeology from a vase that the Hittites actually made 
it sort of looks Native American. Like something you will find in Mexico or Peru. But it's not. It was found in Turkey. Or what is called in the Bible Asia Minor. These are the ancient Hittites. These little brown men and women in this vase. The ancient Hittites. Sons of Japhet. Togoma. And this is another vase. Or vase. And these little brown figures are the ancient sons of Japhet, Togoma, called in secular history the Hittites, as depicted with their own hands. And this is artwork by a modern artist attempting to reconstruct the physical type of the ancient Hittites. And again, we have a vase or vase that the Hittite people themselves constructed. Just like most ancient world people, the Hittite Empire, their population left artifacts, monumental buildings, and other relics from the past. So they could be identified in this present day. So, 3,000 years ago, there was an international war fought in the land of Palestine, Israel, led by the Egyptians and their allies and the Hittites and their allies. And here we have a modern day artist reconstruction of the great chariot battles fought by the Egyptians against the Hittites. And here we have the Pharaoh of Egypt fighting the king of the Hittites in a chariot battle 3,000 years ago. And most artists reconstruct the Hittite people to resemble what we could call physically an Asian type phenotype. Something like a Native American or a Chinese or a Japanese. But they are neither. They're people of Siberia. These are the peoples of the Chamkachala Peninsula. These people are the indigenous people of Russia. They would most likely be more related to the ancient Hittites. They are neither Chinese, nor Japanese, nor American Indians, but they have a similar phenotype. They are actually ancient Japhetic people that still lives in Russia today. These are the indigenous people of Russia. Here's a map to understand the position of the Hittites and the ancient Egyptians in the land of Palestine, Israel, in the middle between these two great empires. The Egyptian Empire under Ramesses II is in green, bordering on the Hittite Empire in red at the height of its power in 1279. B.C. 
and here we have another look at a reconstruction of an ancient Hittite man or a man of Japheth from the nation Togoma and his phenotype is Asian or something close to an Asian physical phenotype and to verify the reconstruction of the ancient Hittites by modern day artists we can take a look at the book a handbook of scientific and literary bible difficulties facts and suggestions helpful towards the solution of perplexing things and sacred scripture on page 25 as to the personal appearance of this race the hittites dr says says the hittites were a people with yellow skins and mongoloid features whose receding foreheads oblique eyes and protruding upper jaws are represented as faithfully on their own monuments as they are on those of Egypt so that we cannot accuse the Egyptian artists of caricature if the Egyptians have made the Hittites ugly it was because they were so in reality this was a Eurocentric point of view but it was a point that had to be made and this fact that European scholars did not see the Hittites as Europeans, but Asians, or in their word, Mongoloids. And Dr. Sace is Archibald Henry Sace, born September 25, 1845, died February 4th, 1933. He was a pioneer British Assyriologist and linguistic who held a chair as professor of Assyriology at the University of Oxford from 1891 to 1919. Okay, so the Hittite Empire that was located in Turkey or Anatolia was Asian or as they called these people at the time Mongoloid and Middle Eastern and of the sons of Japhet Togoma so the land of the Hittites, or the land of Hattai, was what we, or modern-day people, call Anatolia, or Turkey. We look a little lower to the right. Kadesh on the Alterans in Syria is where this battle between the Egyptians and the Hittites were fought. If we look a little further down, we can see the city of Jerusalem. The children of Japheth, the ancient Europeans, had a very diverse physical type. They varied. Some would look like your people of southern India, southern Dravidinians. Some will look like people from Burma or Thailand, or some will look like Aborigines of Australia. The phenotypes of ancient Europeans, Japheth. I will show a brief example. The children of Japheth, one particular group was called Lud. L U D. The name was rendered as Lydia 
and they also lived in Anatolia or Turkey. But this group migrated, when you read Herodotus and other historians, migrated from Asia Minor or Turkey, crossed the sea, and colonized Italy. This map might make this story a little easier to understand. On the right, we have Lydia in Turkey, Asia Minor. And the arrow points to a region in Italy called Eturia. Because the people who were called Lydians moved to a place in Italy. And these people took on the name Etruscans. But they originally lived in Anatolia. And this is a map of the Greeks, Phoenicians, and Etruscans, 900 to 500 BC. In the center of Italy, where it's highlighted or colored purple, that's where the Etruscans lived. The people that was in Asia Minor moved to Italy, and that purple area is the area they colonized in Italy. The ancient people of Japhet were a people that sailed the ocean and the seas. Not too much different than the people of the South Pacific, like Hawaiians. So the trip from Asia Minor to Italy was an easy event or affair. In those days, populations moved at will and colonize the countries that they desired. So here's a picture or a map of Italy and the Etruscan civilization that lasted from 700 to 200 BC. It was a region that Rome will later come out of. These are pre-Roman or a pre-Roman group. The Romans adapted many customs, tradition from the Etruscans. The children of Japhet were the Etruscans and Rome held or owed a debt to the Etruscans for cultural and traditional reasons. They learned a lot from the Etruscans. In this book, Etruscan Researches by Isaac Taylor, 1874, we are going to find out just a little bit more about the Etruscans of Italy. When we turn to page 62, it reads, but the most distinctive physical characteristics of the Mongolian races are high cheekbones in the oblique angle at which the eyes incline to the nose. And this also the remains of Etruscan art point to the same conclusion as the other evidence. The figures on the latter vases or vases and mirrors are to a great extent of the Greek type and must be set aside in any such comparison. But in the earlier works of art, and more especially when we have what may be regarded as a portrait statue, the mongoloid type of feature is frequently conspicuous. So, just like the Hittites, the Etruscans and their artifacts conveyed the idea to the anthropologists and archaeologists that 
the Etruscans of Italy, their physical type, physical features, was of a mongoloid type, what we would classify as today Asian. For example, Chinese and Japanese are classified among among many other people as mongoloid. The ancient Japhetic people of Italy were classified as mongoloid. The people that the Romans learned from the Etruscans of Italy. They are not the forefathers or foremothers of the Japanese or the Chinese, but they shared a similar phenotype. The ancient people of Italy, Etruscans, who formerly lived in Turkey or Asia Minor. Let's take a look at this term, mongoloid. Mongoloid is an obsolete racial grouping of various peoples, indigenous to large parts of Asia, the Americas, and some regions in Europe and Oceania. In the past, other terms such as Mongolian race, yellow, Asiatic and Oriental has been used as synonyms. The concept of dividing humankind into the Mongoloid, Caucasoid, and Negroid races was introduced in the 1780s by members of the Göttingen School of History. It was further developed by Western scholars in the context of racial ideologies during the age of colonialism. With the rise of modern genetics, the concept of distinct human races in a biological sense has become obsolete. In 2019, the American Association of Biological Anthropologists stated, the belief in races as natural aspect of human biology and the structures of inequality racism that emerge from such beliefs are among the most damaging elements in the human experience, both today and in the past.